Hi, I'm Greg Howlett, again here with Danny Crawford. Um, the session, what do you call yourself, studio musician or a session musician? Usually, I just tell people I'm a studio musician, and if they're a musician, they know what you're talking about, but other folks, you have to kind of explain, you know, they give you that look of, wow, that's really interesting, or either this poor guy didn't have a job. <laughs> <laughs> um, exactly. Um, but uh, a session, whatever you want to call it, session, studio, musician, the guys in the studio that make uh, that make music and are blessed to do it for a living. Um, so we've been talking about um, your your long career, long career, and um, and we talked in the first segment about how you got into this work, and um, second segment we talked about um, the sort of the big picture view of the process. But now I want to get into some stuff that might be of interest. And, and there's a couple of reasons why. Now, I know that a lot of you guys will not be studio musicians. Um, maybe you have no desire at all to do that. But yeah, I hear from pianists constantly that might be struggling trying to move from, let's say, the traditional playing out of a hymnal. I don't have a hymnal laying around, but you guys know what a hymnal is. Um, reading music out of a hymnal to accompany maybe your church con uh, congregation and now you're getting all this strange stuff. Um, you get the charts. Um, sometimes you get lead sheets. And that can be um, intimidating. I was talking to Danny earlier this morning. We were sort of complaining. Um, because in church music, I don't know if you guys have seen this before, but you have these, we call them charts, which is basically the lyric. You have lyrics, and then you have just chord symbols written above it. And uh, we were both complaining about that because I've always thought that's just ridiculous. Um, because there's one thing that's very important that's completely left off that chart. The timing. Um, so you can't really play a song off a chart well unless you just sort of get lucky or you know the song. Um, it's, it's almost impossible. So, But that being said, a lot of you guys are dealing with that kind of thing. And um, if you deal with a chart where you don't have any sense of time, where they just put the chords above the uh, above the lyrics we can't really help you with that because <laughs> it's impossible uh, we were trying to figure why did anybody decide this was a good idea but on the other hand um, if you're dealing with lead sheets and the more traditional ways that we know take modern music um, we can help you and uh, so Danny's going to help you in this session with that we're going to talk about charting uh, the big picture and I know you brought in an example so we're going to sort of go through the, how you organize a song on a chart. For example, not steal your thunder. What is this song? No, never, no, never. Um, that's a whole song. Now, if you went to a studio, it just looks like a few numbers, right? But this is a, probably a three minutes, four minutes song, um, and a whole song is built from this. And uh, so you might look at that and say it's impossible, but it's not. Um, and Danny's going to explain how to do it, so go for it. One of the things that I think is so important, Greg, that if people ever realize the importance of knowing numbers and how it relates to music, it totally changes how you think about music. Um, the reason you do that in, in studio environment, without question, you'll walk in, and this happens, happened yesterday, probably twice, you walk in and you start playing the song and the singer says, wow, that's just too high. We need to lower it. Well, if it's written out in letters, then that means you got to stop for five minutes, whatever, and everybody rewrite that chart in the new key. But if it's in numbers, the numbers represent the notes of a scale. And so if, if the song, if you just went through it in B flat and the singer says, wow, we need to drop that a whole step. You say, okay, from B flat down a half steps, A. So you just shift gears mentally to the key of A, and the numbers translate to that. And, and once, it's like I remember, once that light came on for me when I was in, in my teens, the world changed in, in terms of how I see music. And so it, it's not just something, though, just that's handy for sessions. If church pianists can ever get their head around how important it is, it makes their their job so much easier when you know someone comes up and says um, I need to sing a song for offertory and but I need it in a different key than what the music is or you start running through it with them and and you realize it's too low well, what right. do you do and, and if you know the numbers and how it all 
cor corresponds, you can take a few minutes and ju just look at the sheet music. And a lot of times, just by following the bass note in the sheet music, get the idea of, of what numbers are involved. And you can write a quick chord chart and, and play it in any key. Now, yeah. but that brings up a little rabbit trail. Be honest on this one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, do say I don't care how good they are. Do all session lead, are they really comfortable playing in any key, or do they not have favorites? I have my least favorites. Um, for some reason, B, and with a lot of keyboard players, B is just kind of this odd yeah. key, and G flat. Sometimes I just don't. There's something about the way G flat and B lay under my fingers that yeah. is odd. But and one of my good friends, Jeff Collins, he plays, if they listen to any Southern Gospel, they hear Jeff literally every few minutes on the radio. Jeff loves G-flat. He, he grew up playing in that key. And, well, that just makes his day to get to play in that. Yeah. And the, this may be a little bit of a, an odd thing, but some folks relate keys or um, certain tones to colors. And... And that's something I've always done is I relate my keys to certain colors. And so, you know, for me, G, there, and there's no, no purpose in it other than it just, when I'm playing on a certain key, I, I relate it to a certain color. But for me, the key of B is it's almost like static on television. You know, it's just, yeah. <laughs> I have to play in it every day, but I still, I don't have the comfort level yeah. that I would love to have with it. Sure. Okay. But, so I sort of took you down that rabbit trail. So, um, but your point was, and I think the big picture takeaway is, if you get if you get a piece of music in church, and let's say you you, you realize not only do you got to play it, but you got to transpose it. The quick, easy, dirty way to do that is turn it into a numbers chart. So you go through if you can analyze the chords and and, and write in the numbers because once you get to numbers, if you play that way, all of a sudden. Transposing is, is, is a snap. Exactly. It's, all, it's all there is to it. Transposing is one of those things musicians hate. But the reality is, if you use the number system, it's not a big deal. Um, so that's what, sort of what you were getting at before I interrupted. So go keep going. Well, in its most basic element, with a, whether it be a chord chart or a number chart, um, each bar in a song is rep represented by a number. Um, and if, if it's a 16-bar song, then there's at least going to be 16 numbers on, on the page. And basically each, um, each bar has a chord that's being played over it. And the number tells you what chord to play out of that scale or out of the key. Yeah. And, you know, I don't know if this is the time to get, I'm not going to get real deep into it. But, but in its simplest form, you look at the C C major scale, right. and there's eight notes there, right. and you just you basically relate each note of that scale to a chord in the song. So a song that's in C, if anybody has already been playing music, they know that it consists of C, F, and G right. primarily. Yeah. All right, well, what numbers are those out of the scale? C is the first, F is the fourth, five is the uh, G is the fifth. Right. So everywhere you play a C chord. There's a one everywhere. There's a sure, and F. There's a four. Yeah, and and so in a basic basic song, you'll just see those whole numbers written out. But not every song is is going to be just um, basic chords. You get into some measures have more than one chord in them. And you and you, you do, how do you where's the one that has okay. multiple chords? If you're looking at this this chart right here, <clears throat> you'll notice the the second bar of the song. Okay. It's, it's starting out, and it says it's a two minor split, one over three. Okay. Well, some some folks are, okay, well, what, what does all of that mean? Well, first off, in this song, each each bar or each number is getting four beats. Right. And when it's called a split bar like this, and some people write, there's two different ways that it's primarily written. Some people will put it in parentheses, just for myself, I, I put a dividing mark. Yep. So this is telling me that for the first two beats of that four beat bar, I'm playing a two minor, which um, this, this song was in D when we recorded it. So one is my D, everywhere it says two, 
minor, that's an E minor. Sure. And so I know that I'm going to play a D for four beats, an E minor for two beats, but now what about this back half of the, the bar, the remaining two beats? It's not half, it's a third. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> One over and, three. Yeah. So what that's telling the keyboard player, the top number is what my right hand plays, which is still the D, and my left hand plays the three, which is an F sharp. The other guys on the session, if you're playing a guitar, anything you know that plays an actual chord, they're following the top number. So the guitar player's playing the D, but the bass player, he looks at it and knows he's playing the F sharp. Yep. And so then the next next bar he knows has the four with the little um, triangle outside yep. of it. And um, you know anybody that if they've studied much chord theory, they know that a, a triangle designates major seven. So that tells me that. I have two bars right there of a G major seven. Okay. Then you have your, you use, just like in regular music, that's, uh, what do you call these uh, repeat signs? Just, yeah. And then talk especially about that, uh, what's going on at the end of that first line. Okay, you'll notice the four major seven has a little yep. triangle, also has a diamond, or like a diamond drawn around it, and they would refer to that as a, a diamond chord, or they say play a four diamond. And diamond basically means to treat it like a whole note where you just strike it and let it hold. If you notice in this example here, it hits and it holds not only for its four beats, but holds over the mm. two beats of the next next bar. So if you were playing that, that would be like one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Yep. Okay. So that's a tie mark, in other words. The diamond is tied. And, uh, exactly. Yeah, keep going. And so here... It, you know, so you have your one over three again, the same chord from the intro. The little, uh, that's called, we call, consider that a push mark, mm -hmm. uh, which basically means that in this particular song, instead of it being played on the downbeat, it was actually played, actually played on the fourth, I think the fourth beat of the bar before, but it, it has this pushed feel, so it's be like one, two, three, four, one. So he said the accent, and, and I know you are seeing it on the screen, but we're talking about the accent. It looks like the accent mark over the one. Mm -hmm. You classical music musicians would see it as an accent mark, but it's a push on a chart. So we call it push. And the, most of this one flows flows pretty smoothly. You, you have your five sus, which means suspended. Basically means you raise your third. And a suspended chord always pretty much resolves back down to its its uh, natural root of the chord. Um, and suspension just always lets you know it's not over. There's something else that's about to happen. And when you start looking in the chorus here, there's not really any any new chords introduced to you. It's all things you've already been playing in the song. But it takes a little bit of a different twist right here. I can't read that. What is that? It's a, sharp. It's a five sharp diminished seven. seven. And it's, it's, it's the kind of chord that if you've not ever thought about, okay, what makes a, a chord diminished? And it, it's a little bit complex to think of, especially if you're trying to think about it real quick. But it, it basically is, is used as a transition chord that normally transitions you in nine times out of ten, a five sharp five, diminished six. section to a six minor. So a, a question for you on this one. Um, is that the you're not going to play five sharp diminished in the left hand, right? You, or do you? Do you play? Do you actually play this in the left hand? Well, depending on the key, but or do you split those notes up between both hands? Um, generally, I, I would play the the whole chord with my right hand, and and then my left hand, I would I would definitely do the root, the root, the sharp the five, five, yeah, five sharp, and may would catch an okay. upper note. You generally you don't want don't want to have too many low notes in the left hand chord if it's way below middle yeah. C. It just yeah. you know, gets really muddy. so. So in other words, you really think of that as the five is the root, right? And the the sh or the five sharp five is the root. The diminished seven does that apply to um, what does it actually apply to the five? Wait, wait, it applies to the five. Just, yeah, here that, here you're playing two beats of a G, then two beats. Oh, it's a split bar. Then two okay. beats. Of a um, A sharp or B flat diminished seven. Do you know what just threw me there? Because I was thinking that was a uh, an inversion, but it's not. That's your split. Oh, 
because your split, you the way you do it is you use a horizontal line for a inversion, and then you for a split yeah. you use a where a lot of printed music uses it like you were just just thinking they'll they'll show it where you know the right hand chord is on one side and the left yeah. on the other and yeah. So that's I was that I was leading y'all astray here on that. So that's just it's a the whole chord is five. Shots. I was thinking, yeah, never mind. But um, yeah, keep going. I think it's interesting about about the diminished seven chord. If you re really got deep into the theory of it, you'd you'd see that there's actually only three diminished chords that exist. Yeah. And 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 I always refer to it as a train track chord because it has that sound. Yeah. You know, when the old song was the guy had the, the girl tied to the train track and you hear the train coming. Yeah. yeah. And when you when you think and see the theory behind what notes make up a, a diminished seven, when you take that, look at the notes that you're playing. If you move it up one time mm. yeah. and then a second time, when you get to the third time, it's the same notes you started with, just a different inversion. So Really, diminished seven chords. You only have to kind of tuck away three of them. Is it and generally accepted? Obviously, in the right hand, it doesn't matter. Any inversion play is still going to be based on the root. But would you actually change? Um, is it acceptable to change that chord to any of its inversions, or do you need to play the inversion there if you see it on a chart? Um, it's it's open to interpretation. Whatever inversion you want to play it in, yeah. it doesn't have to. Five sharp doesn't have to be the bottom note in your right hand. Yeah, yeah. So, a couple other things that's interesting here. Um, this is a, a fairly common move that you'll see in, in gospel, where you have two beats of the, the one chord, then you're passing underneath with a seven flat that tells you something else is about to happen. And here it, it moves into some chords that are really out of the ordinary for what you would typically find in a, a bridge of most gospel songs, but it goes into the seven, six flat and seven flats. And, um, and here's another interesting chord. My writing probably doesn't make it very easy to I'm, I'm to trying see. to figure out, are you a bad writer or my <laughs> eyes really bad? This, this measure, the third measure of the bridge, says a one split, one, two, over a one. Uh -huh. What that's telling me is that a typical one chord you know, it's just your your major, but anytime if you see just a two, that that means drop the third down to a to the second. Leave out the third. Exactly. Okay. Which that's neither major nor minor. Yeah. But that tells me that that needs to happen. Two beats major, two beats of a, and I add two, but over one bass. So that'd be like a one, two, three, four, and then a whole bar of one. Yep. And here was just some little scribbling notes I know I made about a, a passing chord that that only applied to me. Right. Yeah. Uh, the guitar players didn't have to worry about it. But um, tick marks is that tick marks I see over there? Is are those tick marks that tell you to play one beat and three beats? Um, or is that what I'm reading? That's something a little. I'm glad you you mentioned that. You'll see it here at the end of the chorus. Then into this course, generally that's referred to as a five eleven chord, ah. and which is the same thing as a four over five. System. And and so I'll a lot of times I'll just write it as the five eleven because it's it's quicker than writing out the other. And everybody that works on the session with me and some other guys, they always know if they see five eleven, that's play a four over five. In all my life, I've never heard that. I mean, I, obviously, it's suspended dominance you hear, but I've never heard it. I've never heard. It. So that's typical Nashville. That's Nashville. Uh, Nashville notation would be yeah, five eleven. Five eleven. As opposed to you guys, with a lot of you know it is either four or five, or the sus five. Uh, but it's the same thing. The eleven is the same thing as four, which would be your suspension in the in the dominant chord. I'm glad I asked. Yeah. So this is. Um, now this brings up the other point because you guys, I think you guys get the idea again. There actually is a lot here. There's not many, not many. Um, it doesn't look like a lot, but there actually is a lot of specific stuff. Um, for example, um, we have the. Uh, we didn't, go ahead. Didn't talk about the, how the repeat signs apply when you get down to the first 
end of the first chorus. Yes. The repeat signs, and that basically is telling us to go back to the middle of the intro, which serves as a quote turnaround. Ah, okay. And so once you hit that point, you just play straight down the page because there's no more repeat signs. Okay. So. So that would be sort of like you'd see repeat signs in printed normal printed music. Exactly. Um, the question I have for you is a question. Of, it's a philosophical question, and it's the issue of democracy in the, in the process. So you got. Uh, don't start laughing on me. <laughs> this is the way I talk. Um, the issue of democracy. I and you know one of the big things about music in the 20th century when you started seeing mu music move away from where the composer has ultimate authority to pass in that responsibility on to the musicians. And so the musicians, in other words, have a lot of latitude to create music on their own. So in other words, in, in regards to the chart, we're not telling them every single note to play. We're giving them a roadmap. Exactly. Now, on the other hand, you can obviously get very specific in this roadmap where you are controlling a lot of things. For example, the diamond is a good example, maybe the push and, and some of these other, um, where you're sort of giving them sort of specific advice. What is, the, what is the mindset among musicians? How much is too much when you start? When you start, How far can you go in giving them um, direction on exactly what to do in certain situations before they start thinking, uh, why don't you hire a monkey? Why, what did you hire me for? I'm supposed to create, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. How do you know the difference? Most musicians are hired for their musical personality, uh, which yeah. which means that anybody that if they listen to Greg play long enough, they'll say, "Yeah, that sounds like Greg Halleck playing right there." You know, Bruce Hornsby to me the classic exactly, example yeah, of that. Yeah, you can hear a Bruce Hornsby lick and you're, Psh. yeah, no doubt. Yeah, on the gospel and countryside, Floyd Kramer was sure. one of the ones. And so when when guys are hired for their their style. When you hand them a chart, you're basically saying, "Okay, here's here's the, uh, the the blank canvas, but you you choose the colors of your choice to yeah. to fill this in or to, to color this coloring book, whatever." And and so, unless there's some designated little recurring hook or lick in the song that is a signature to it, those you do need to write out because everybody needs to be on the same page. But outside of that, um, you know, guys, some you know, somebody may may say, "Well, can you can you do me a an Anthony Burger lick right here, or or can you make it sound like so and so?" You at least need to to know what they're talking about, have a reference, because a lot of times some somebody may say, "Can you make this? Can you give this a Bruce Hornsby feel, or a, make it sound like Band Chicago?" Well, you got to have a reference <laughs> of what that sounds like, but at the same time, it, if all they wanted you to play all day was like so and so, you need to. You kind of feel like saying, "Well, why didn't you just book so?" Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean that's yeah. got to be. Uh, I mean, I, I hate to throw you under the bus here, but I mean that's got to be so annoying in session sometimes. If somebody tries to control you to that point, where you think, "Yeah, you should have just gone and hired whoever your favorite <laughs> pianist is," um, but in this regard, for example, you got specifics. You got diamonds in here um, because you feel in those three diamonds. Those are important. It's important, right? That that everybody uh, uh, interpret that particular bar that way, yeah. as opposed to playing um, whatever they might be doing through there. Uh, it's an interesting little thing about how far how far you go with that. But in general, musicians want to have some latitude, right? For the That's most part, right. yeah. And, and when you when you apply this back over to, well, it's great for studio, but how is that good for me at church? If, especially if you're at a church where you're using more than just piano or piano and organ, if you have a bass player and a drummer, they need to be looking at something structured like that, and it it just it makes your rehearsals go so much smoother. It makes your music sound so much more together and professional. And yeah, we're we're doing it for God. And some people say, well, he's looking at our heart. Well. <laughs> He is, but he also wants us to, to give it our best and be, you know, make it sound as good as we can for it. Right. So again, the difference between this and what we were complaining about at the beginning was you can walk, you know exactly when to play every single chord exactly when every single chord. Uh, so the time is here, um, which is a thing that was sort of missing.
from what we were discussing earlier, where you just have lyrics and chords written up over. Mm -hmm. So if somebody wants to go out and change the world on that and get rid of those charts, somebody feel free. Uh, <laughs> feel free to do that. Change those kind of charts for these kind of charts. Or lead sheets. Um, I guess that'll do it for this one, unless you wanted to add. We're going to talk one more segment, um, which will be um, licks. Um, and uh, I guess I'll, let's introduce licks so people will watch the next segment. Um, but when we talk about licks, Basically, we are, how would you define a lick? Some, some people also refer to it as, as feels. Okay, and, feels, yeah. And, but I, I mean, I, I call it licks. Now, you're from the too. South like me, so when we say feel, we yeah. mean F-I-L-L, -L, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> feel. And, and it has to be a two-syllable Yeah, word, exactly. Feel. But um, you're basically, when you, if you think of it as, as feels, uh -huh. you're basically filling in or putting a musical feel between the the lyric, the open lyric lines, and so, you know, if you were doing Amazing Grace, the clap, you think of what words in the song do you hold out? So if you were doing Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me, you know, Six while beats. me is happening, yeah. you know, there's empty space there, and so an instrument would feel that. Mm -hmm. But when you're doing whether you're doing it with a studio band or a church band, you need to be tasty in how that's done because you don't want the piano player playing her fields, his fields, and the guitar player over there playing a field because the chances that they're both going to decide <laughs> out of all the mil millions of licks in the universe to choose from, they're not going to choose the same one at the same time. Yeah. It, it usually clashes. And so, um, and, and that kind of brings up one other little quick point. If you were to, to flip through these some of these charts, you would see that out beside the verse, out beside the chorus, it's, we'll just pencil it in who has the feels oh, really? okay. for that. Okay. And so that way, while I'm playing, if I see uh, Pino, P-N-O, right out beside the, mm -hmm. the second verse, and then maybe the tag, I know that when it gets there, I need to get away from playing rhythm and get more into the busy, yeah. the feel stuff. The stuff. But other times, if it says guitar or st steel guitar or whatever, I need to be sitting there supporting that with good, clean rhythm playing, not yeah. doing my thing. So show us, uh, as we close this one, show us one quick lick or feel. Um, <laughs> I was going to say I'll sing Amazing Grace while you do it, but I'm not going to. Uh, just demonstrate a medium complex feel for us. Okay. If you were traditionally doing the song Amazing Grace in G, when it got to that point of that saved a wretch, the hymn book would have you just go like, and then just take a nap. Yeah. Okay. And then you come back. Yeah. If, if you were playing that for a congregation, even this wouldn't necessarily just be a studio thing. Yeah. Just something really basic you can do. Okay. Just filled in that little space, but yeah. then you, you're back out of the way. If you wanted to get into something a little more complex or country or tasty. Um, you can... yep. and, and that's just two of literally unlimited it really is things unlimited. that are yeah. out there. You know, that one right there had just a little bit of a country feel if you wanted to have more of a classy churchy da -da 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 -da. Octaves and chords, but it's all based off of that chord that that's okay. holding out. All right, good. So we're going to get into that in more detail here coming up in the next segment. Um, I'll see you then, and um, and we'll get into that as deep as you want to.